Lo siento. That's it. <laughs> End of the Spanish. So uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, if nothing else, where I live in Vermont in the USA, there is still a little snow on the ground. So to be here, it's very pleasant. Um, so the presentation today is about how brands grow. And it's applicable whether you're operating in one country or many countries. The fundamental difference between operating in one country and in many countries is making sure that you understand both the local culture and the competitive landscape. And as I go through, I'm going to pull on those two themes a little bit, just to sh in terms of the examples that we're going to look at. So, this presentation is really all about playing the game. Playing the game to win, because I think all of our companies, we're not playing to lose. We want to win market share, we want to make profit, we want to grow the value of our brands and give a good shareholder return. So this presentation is all about playing the game, or maybe not playing the game. So we're going to talk a little bit about playing to win. This is looking at an analysis that I conducted using the Brand Z database, which is one of the biggest brand equity databases in the world, looking at a five-year time frame. So taking brands that we measured in 2007 and 2008 and seeing how they performed over the next five years. Then we're going to look at brands that have decided they don't want to play an existing game. They have essentially created a new category. Number three, changing the rules. If you're working in an existing category, one of the major ways that you improve your market share is essentially by breaking the rules for that category. And then, last but not least, the first two rely heavily on innovation, creating a new way of doing business. Maybe your company has not got a new innovation to launch this year. Then it's the job of marketing to make sure that you play for time, to keep the profits coming in, to keep the market share that you already have, so that you can then launch innovation the next year or the year after that. And then we'll end with 10 rules for growth that I see coming out of this analysis. Okay? So playing to win. What are the chances that your brand will grow? So, as I said, what I did here was to take five years of data. So brands that we measured in 2007, or 2008, and then looking at the same brands five years later, so 2012 and 2013. Now we have more recent data, but does anybody want to guess why uh, I didn't look at 2009 versus 2014? Anybody? Well, we had a little problem. <laughs> in, in the economy, right? And so there were lots of changes that took place between 2009 and 2014 that were entirely due to the economic circumstances. And therefore, it, it was better, if you like, to bridge that gap than to see how things have changed. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Key finding. Three out of five brands, their market share did not change. And although this is a survey-based market share metric, it is one that we know correlates very strongly with actual market share. So three out of five brands don't change their market share over a five-year time frame. Now, unfortunately for us and our objectives within a company, as brand managers or marketing managers, marketing directors, that seems, you know, I'm sure our objectives don't say we want the same market share this year as we had last year. I'm sure our objectives say we need to grow our market share. And that's unfortunate because for many brands that is a good result. That is what I would call a win. 
Because in the absence of new innovation, you're unlikely to get a large change in market share. But what you have done, if you're the brand manager who's managed to hold their market share constant over time, you have delivered five years, hopefully, five years of profit that your company would not have otherwise. So what happened to the other brands? Well, slightly fewer, so slightly less than one in five brands grew. Slightly more than one in five brands actually declined. So why is there a little bit of a difference there? It's entirely due to the fact that if you look at the brands that declined, they tend to decline because new brands come into the category. New brands that have something innovative to offer to the consumer. And that can be within a country, it can be across countries. And when you are marketing in a, a country outside of your own, one of the critical things you have to ask yourself is, am I going to be relevant to the local consumer in the other country? Probably you have developed a big, well-established brand in Spain. The question then is, do I actually have something that's new and different in the country to which I wish to export? Or I wish to launch my brand? And often, unfortunately, the answer is no. We'll look at an example in a minute where a brand has been pretty successful here in Spain. But if you look at, for instance, the Netherlands, it's been much less successful. And it's entirely due to the differences between the two countries. Key point, many of the brands that grew were small brands. So they, if you look at the, the, the bottom 25% in terms of market size, back in 2007, 2008, they grew by an average of 11.2%. The largest brands in the survey tend to decline. You know why? Because you are a target. If you manage the big brand in the category, if you are the, particularly the biggest, then everybody is out to take a little bit of your market share because for them that's a big increase. So if you're managing a big brand, there are lots of inherent advantages you probably have great distribution if you're a package good, for instance. You probably have many service outlets if you're a service business. But you're also the target for everybody else. So in the short term, there are lots of positive returns to being big. Over a five-year time frame, everybody's gunning for you. So how do brands succeed? The basic conclusion that I come to when I look at an analysis over time is it's all about innovation. But that's not just innovation in product. It can be innovation in positioning. For some brands, it just needs to be an innovation in the way that they communicate. So their marketing can provide that point of differentiation that's so important. Technology companies, um, banks, financial services, then they probably have to think more about product innovation because people think more about their purchases. When they come to choose a new bank, they will probably, for a short period of time, put a little bit of thought into it. If it's choosing a new beer, then they're much more likely to be influenced by simply how quickly the brand comes to mind. So I just want to look at one example of a brand that essentially changed the game. They created a new product category, and it's a pretty obvious example, it's Nespresso. Now, I think the interesting thing is Nespresso gets used as an example um, quite often, but what many people don't recognize is just how long the brand has been around in the marketplace. When it was first launched, it was not necessarily that successful, and it took a while for them to understand exactly how they can go to market and make it successful. But the reason I like using Nespresso as a case study is that the strategy is very clever. 
in terms of what we call the blade and razor strategy of, as Gillette does, giving away the handle, or in the case of Nespresso, selling the coffee machine cheaply, but then the blades and the refills, the coffee pods, that's where you make your money, because those are the things that people are buying time after time. But I think the other thing is that by very carefully dis controlling their distribution, they are avoiding retailer pressure. So because so much of their sales go through their own boutiques and through their own website, they are immune to a lot of the pressures that I know are particularly strong here in Spain. So for instance, they don't have the store saying, right, I want a bigger slice of the money you're making from your sales. And obviously, at the time when they first launched, this was truly unique. You could make espresso at home, but it was laborious, it took time, and it was messy. And so they're offering a much more convenient way of doing it. And you, I think the classic thing that they've done is to make sure that they do not cheapen the brand. So Nowadays, they are facing more competition. There are unbranded versions of their coffee pods. But this is the point at which they need to move from, if you like, a tangible differentiation to more an emotional and intangible differentiation. So I wrote a book um, called Brand Premium, which was published a year ago, two years ago now. Wow, time flies. Um, one of the key th people that I interviewed was the Insight Director for Di Global Insight Director for Diageo, mm -hmm. and he said the important thing about branding is to maintain the feeling of difference. 